Well, thank you for having us. Uh, just by way of introduction, I am a director in the Scientific Advisory Services, and I work with um, our uh, colleagues in business development in understanding clients' needs, uh, understanding their research, and help develop research strategies from very early discovery all the way through to pre-market and help design and uh, have the most efficient uh, program possible to get into human clinics uh, as quickly as possible. And today I'll be joined by our panelists, uh, Denny Roy from Silucin and Mary Ellen Casenza from MEC Regulatory and Toxicology Consulting. And I'll have them give their own introductions a little bit later on. I like to use this pictorial as an example of a small molecule program where you start off with thousands, sometimes tens or even millions of compounds being screened and trying to identify the ideal candidate to take through the many steps of drug development to hopefully reach to uh, one, uh, succeeding to get into the market, uh, being approved to be able to treat the patients at large. In order to do so, uh, drug development is a complex process with uh, many different stages of uh, development and information gathering to learn. Uh, today's uh, discussion is not really to focus on the different elements of it, uh, but more to talk about the overall strategy uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, identify uh, a key, uh, an ideal candidate and be able to go through its uh, uh, development as quickly as possible. When we think about small molecules, this is a, a small little table of some of the uh, key properties that one should be looking at to be able to understand um, the different attributes that a small molecule should have in order to be able to be successfully developed into the, into the market. And for um, other drug classes like monoclonal antibodies, um, they have different criteria. Um, this lists those that would be used for a monoclonal antibody. But as you can imagine with um, other entities of different classes, it could be oligonucleotides, gene therapies, these criteria changes. So it's really important to be able to understand what are those characteristics that are important um, to, for an ideal candidate to have for development. Uh, in developing that strategy, I'm using uh, Charles Rivers' subway map of service offerings. And I'm not gonna go through all this, it takes too much time, but uh, each drug development program will be unique in the sense that it will take elements of this subway map uh, to be used in order to develop a successful clinical candidate. And for each program, for each different class of compound, for each different therapeutic indication, um, this strategy would, or number of different activities would be customized towards it. And the ultimate goal is to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that can um, hurt a candidate's progress. Um, I've listed here some of the major ones, the lack of exposure in the clinic, the lack of efficacy, or due to overt toxicities such that uh, benefit versus risk ratio is too great for the drug to be able to be successfully um, approved for use. So when we think about designing the preclinical strategy, it really is dependent on understanding um, those different markers. And today we'll be talking about the overall strategy, regardless if you are in a virtual biotech company or an academic or a mid-tier or large pharma, the goals of drug development is gonna be fairly common and what we will be discussing today is some of the, the key elements and how to develop that strategy. Um, in that strategy, you are uh, going to examine the three major elements of an ID submission that's needed for regulatory approval to move forward into the clinic. 
um, as well as into the market. That's clinical trials, CMC, and the farm pharmacology toxicology sections. And these are all three independent, but interdependent um, factors that come in. Uh, so having a comprehensive way of dealing with all the needs in these major categories is really important. So today's panelists, as I mentioned before, we um, discussing with me in the beginning of this webinar. And at the end of the webinar, uh, we'll have uh, Kristen Power, my colleague at Charles River, who will moderate and ask those questions that are posed. So during the question and answer period, please feel free to write into the Q&A any comments that you may have or any questions that you would like to ask the panelists. So with that, I'm going to start off with uh, asking Mary Ellen to uh, give a brief introduction to herself. Thanks, Sam, and thanks to uh, ULP, University Lab Partners, and Charles River for putting this together. I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion today. So as you said, I'm Mary Ellen Casenza. I'm a regulatory toxicologist. I worked in the industry over 30 years. The last 20 years of my industry experience was at Amgen. I retired from there a little over five years ago, and I've been consulting um, in the regulatory tox space since. And I would say probably a large percentage of my work is in the early development phase, helping people get um, through pre-IND meetings, INDs, and, and uh, through drug development from that point. So this is obviously a, to a topic close to my heart. Um, and just to explain the picture behind me, I also am adjunct at USC. I teach in the regulatory science program a number of different courses on toxicology and drug development and regulatory science. So that's who I am. Great. Um, I'll ask the first question to you, Mary Ellen. Um, you know, with our variety of different clients seeking out your experience and expertise, uh, when would you recommend a client come to you to ask for that advice? Well, I always say early is better. Um, you know, I largely work in the large molecule space, biologics, cell and gene therapies, things like that. So in those projects, um, you know, deciding on the tox plan early is really important. Uh, figuring out what data you need to show that um, a toxicology species is potentially relevant or not, um, and planning, you know, putting together your strategy and your plan and deciding when you want to have a pre-IND meeting, um, you know, really early is better. So um, sometimes people come to me really early and I just have some general advice for them and then they don't, you know, say come back in a year. Other times that they come too late, you know, if you run a million dollar monkey study and it's not the right study or not the right species, that's a huge investment, um, unnecessary um, work. So early is good. Great. Uh, Denny, do you have anything to add? You're on mute. Denny, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, mute doesn't help when it's coming to communication, so apologies for that. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with Mary Ellen. I think, you know, ideally the earlier the better. Sometimes it's kind of hard to grasp what early means. Um, you can have situations where, you know, people assume that you go and reach out for a toxicology consultant or non clinical development consultant when you're ready to do the IND enabling or tox work. And we came to realize in our experience that sometimes there's definitely a benefit. Do not wait until you start thinking about toxicology to start thinking about engaging with someone. We've had um, you know, programs or projects and clients reaching out way early, uh, which is great. And then there will be or could be opportunities where you can design some elements of your discovery or lead candidate nomination program that will educate and inform later on for your safety study. So um, you know, I always say anytime you should reach out, but yeah, the earlier the better kind of concept I also like to apply it to even before most people start thinking about the non-clinical safety aspect of their program. Yeah, uh, for myself, I, I agree with both of you. And just to add on to that, I think that, you know, Marianne, you brought in, like they talked to you maybe a year earlier than you don't hear anything. I think constant communication also within 
uh, as things develop is also very important to be able to kind of spot check, gain advice, where are you going? Because sometimes the data can lead you in a different direction. And I think that having that touch points and, and keeping um, consultants close to you to, to monitor the progress is also very, very helpful. Um, and especially when you're getting ready to transition to the next, it's better to plan much earlier uh, so that uh, you're able to, especially if you're new to it, uh, to be able to gain that uh, knowledge and say, okay, I need to plan for X, Y, and Z. I didn't realize that before. And now you have the time to do it without rushing it or stressing over it and be more methodical and be able to, um, to grow in a more orderly past, uh, fashion and not have uh, unmitigated delays because you didn't think of something. Um, with that, Denny, would you mind giving an introduction to yourself? Uh, sure. Um, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, really a pleasure to be able to have this productive discussion and exchange here. Um, so my name is Denny Roy. Um, I'm a toxicologist by training. I work for a consulting firm um, and I've been in the industry. I think Mary Ellen would probably add up to 60 years here. So about, you know, 30 years. I spent half of my career in the, what I call the service business. So I worked at a CRO, used to be called CTBR, now calls Charles Rivers, <laughs> um, and uh, the consulting environment. So this is my second consulting company throughout my career. The other half of my career has been spent uh, in the biotech pharma industry. Uh, you know, one of the biggest one, obviously, culminating to uh, Amelin Bristol Myers Squibb and um, you know, then joined the consulting area. My expertise is in the, what we call the three main areas of non-clinical drug developments, all the strategic aspects, you know, questions like what do we do, when do we need to do certain things for certain therapeutics, certain regional um, you know, uh, jurisdictions in terms of regulatory authorities. Uh, the other area of expertise that we have is also execution. So, a lot of the times people uh, you know, have a great plan on paper, comes a time to execute, and that's where we have a lot of expertise to help them, which leads to the last part, which is um, expertise in regulatory interaction and submission. So in a nutshell, that's essentially my, my expertise and experience and glad to be here today. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, Denny, uh, when you have a new client coming and approaching you, uh, do you employ a standard approach when you start engaging a client? That's a great question. So uh, more or less, yes, but it will vary quite a bit depending on the situation you're in. Um, but there's a common um, kind of common elements that we use in our approach and understanding and, and figuring out how we can help, um, you know, a company. The first one, obviously, is the engagement, you know, getting to know um, who's the company, but then it quickly uh, translates into really understanding what is it that we're looking at here in terms of drug development. So what technology, what kind of hurdles might be present? What is the uh, nature of the product that the company is trying to develop? Trying to understand more on an overall kind of development perspective is really, you know, the first, um, you know, matter that we pay attention to and engage with the client. Um, once we have a better understanding of where they are and where they need to go, one of the second really key critical step in trying to help someone in their development is to understand what expertise do you have or not currently on your team and how that can uh, be an opportunity for that partnership and then add on that expertise as needed on their development team. Because in reality, before we start even thinking about engaging on helping or doing the work, we wanna make sure we understand what's the company goal, what are their expertise elements where there may be gaps in their support. And that's the start of the planning of how we're going to go about and execute. Last part that, you know, obviously then, you know, there's the whole contractual, you know, side of it, but then it, it comes to executing and making sure that we have an integrated approach and play as part of the team that is involved in that development. So that's typically how we approach, um, you know, engaging with, with uh, potential, you know, clients or people that need our help. Thanks. Uh, Mary Ellen, how about you? Well, I'm a little different in that I'm more of an independent consultant, although I, I um, you know, do work with some consulting groups that pull me in as, as needed. Um, so I would say, you know, a lot of my clients are actually uh, former colleagues from my years at Amgen, or even sometimes before that. And so they call me in for, you know, a specific um, issue or to help, you know, with the toxicology strategy. 
but then I'll partner with other, you know, um, consulting groups if, you know, they need broad help uh, writing, publishing, things like that. And so sometimes Denny and I've had the opportunity to work together <laughs> um, on projects. So it's not a standard, standard approach. It sort of depends on, on what the needs are. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen, you know, one of the common mistakes that I encounter in my interactions with new clients is that they come from a more naive uh, point of view when it comes to toxicology. They're experts in their field, but, but they, they don't know toxicology so well, and they make the assumptions on what a relevant species is. They say, oh, small molecule is gonna be uh, always rat and dog. And um, I had one example where they, uh, the client had actually completed all the acute and short-term studies in rat and dog, and then came to us and said, okay, we're really ready to start doing the IND enabling. We've done all the work, we're now ready to start. And I asked them if they had done ADME and uh, the, it turned out that the dog was not an appropriate species. So what advice would you give uh, to a, a prospective client in how they should go about determining what is an appropriate species? Yeah, so this is a topic close to my heart, being <laughs> someone who's worked largely in the bi you know, biologics in the last 25 years. Um, so with small molecules, obviously, it's sort of a different you know, focus. Very often, how you select your species is based on metabolism, as you said. And so you, know, you need to look at that up front. Um, with biologics, relevancy is based more on pharmacological relevancy. So again, this kind of goes back to our very first question, why it's important to engage with people like Denny and myself early, right? Because you don't want to be going down that path and doing all that preliminary work or even getting to a GLP study and doing that in a non-relevant species. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Denny, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think it's it's a great uh, a great way to frame it. Um, I would totally agree with that. There are, I mean, again, reaching out early. I think you know, Maria Ellen um, hits the nail right on there. Um, it's critical not only for cost related you know problems or issues. And in your example here, you know, the likelihood that this would be acceptable to an agency is is you know, there's a risk there, and that could cost the company significant time. Which sometimes, if you're a small organization, you have some investors, you have some you know milestone promise either to market or venture caps, it puts you in a very difficult situation. So yeah, you definitely gain in making sure that you inject the science into your program. And typically, I always tell uh, you know our clients or people that are doing drug development, uh, you know, doing things because it was done like that before is typically a red flag. Um, and the other thing that people assume is when you read guidance document, they're just guidance and you have to follow them. And that's what the FDA expects, not realizing that there's a lot of science injected in it. Um, so, you know, when Mary Helen highlights the fact that you need to consider biological activity, uh, you know, that that's a, is a critical point. Um, there's usually a list of things that people we recommend consider, uh, you know, in selecting their species in your example here. And there's, 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 there's not a unique factor in our mind that will drive your decision. Again, if you, if you overlay the science on your decision on your development program, that will typically, you know, increases your chance of, of success. So, uh, you know, you mentioned PKA DME, uh, you know, the biology, the anatomy of the animal, it, depending on the root of administration you're gonna use, uh, a choice of a species may not be a good option. Um, there's also some considerations in terms of, you know, the timelines you're facing. So if you're looking at a um, possibility that you could use two different species, but one is less available than the other, then that might be a driving decision. It's less scientific, but it does nonetheless act in the context of a scientific decision. So there's a whole list of, of um, you know, there's also regulatory requirements that, that typically clients need to consider, and I think the key is just make sure that you overlay the science in your decision making and not just repeat what has been done before. I yeah, if I could just cool. add to that, yeah. um, you know, I think it's really important to, to be really clear about whether the species is relevant, um, not just because of timelines and waste of drug and waste of money, but a waste of animals, right? I mean, I know people think of people like myself, you know, as toxicologists is, of sacrificing a lot of animals on a regular basis, but I always try never to sacrifice any animal unnecessarily, right? 
And so I think it's an ethical question as well. You really need to make sure you're selecting right species and not running studies in inappropriate species for that reason. So I just want to throw that in. I think that's a great point, especially since uh, for Charles River, we hold the three R's, which is really in, in making sure that we use animals in the most appropriate way and limit the use as much as possible. So thank you so much for bringing up that point. And I see Kristen, I think it wants to say something. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to interject. We had a question from the audience. Um, I thought it might be a good time to, to bring it up given the context here. Um, the question was, what is the best approach for introducing new drug delivery mechanism or drug carrier to the FDA, which can be used for multiple new drugs? Uh, very good question. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? I, I can take a, a first shot. Um, so that's an excellent question, and we're seeing those more and more. So the question sounds like it's approaching it from a platform, so making sure that you can use some strategic approach in your development so you can generate data that it is not just applicable for maybe the active ingredient you're developing, but for a series of products. So trying to leverage that delivery system as a platform and how you get the FDA comfortable with maybe some of the data you generate. Um, if, the if I understood the question correctly, um, what we have seen and typically what is a good idea is even earlier on, again, injecting some of those endpoints that might learn, help you learn or educate more on when you move to the safety assessment part of it. And in designing your program, if it is a completely new delivery system, you might be in a situation where because of the newness of your delivery system, the FDA will have the same expectation from a safety, you know, not compromising patient safety. So therefore, the data you're going to generate is, is probably going to be expected along the lines of what any new chemical entity or any new novel excipient or delivery would be expected to do. But, however, if you design smartly your non-clinical program, and an example is adding an additional control group with just your delivery system, you might start generating now not only safety data on your product, but also your delivery technology. And you start building that safety database that over time, as you generate data and demonstrate that the safety does not change, it might definitely help you leverage and engage with the FDA about your delivery system more in the context of a platform than a you know, specific product. Right. Um, for, for Charles River, we see a lot of um, researchers and companies actually focus on more platform systems and, and actually uh, developing drug carriers or delivery systems, um, specifically not in association with an actual drug. And there are regulations, much to what Denny has spoken to, um, for safety considerations, there are regulations and guidances that help uh, formulate the strategy for um, understanding the safety of it. And uh, yes, the FDA will want to approve it before you use it as a, a, a vehicle for other drugs. Um, but that is something that is uh, continuously actively developed by many different companies. So it is a worthwhile stream to go through. Denny? Yeah, if I can add, um, yeah, that you made me think about something else. Engaging early again is going to be a recurring theme today um, becomes critical. We see a lot of people making assumptions, whether it's a delivery system or a formulation. Um, again, because it's been used before, it must be safe. It's an approved product. That's a common mistake we see. Um, you need to consider all of the science behind it. It may be approved for a different route, for a different indication, at a different level. And a, your unique situation with your product might trigger still some safety concerns that may get you in trouble if you make the assumption because it's an approved product or, you know, grass listed is another one. Yeah. Great. Mary Ellen? Yeah, just um, in terms of drug delivery, I know this is about mechanisms, but I've worked on some drug delivery devices. And so, you know, again, I just throw that out as another thing to think about if you are considering something that would be, um, a device as part of this mechanism, you then again, you need to engage early because you're going to be talking about working with multiple divisions of the FDA at the same time, right? If you have to bring in the Center for Device Devices. Great, thank you. Um, Denny, 
in my very short slide presentation, I had included a slide that showed the three major elements of an IND application, uh, clinical trial protocol, CMC, and the pharmacology, toxicology section. How important is it, in your opinion, about coordinating those efforts between the three, or do you see them as separate entities that run on independent streams? Yeah, and on the last part, absolutely not. It is critical to integrate. And I know it's a common mistake. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's some natural tendency, you know, you need to focus on some chemistry manufacturing issue. That makes sense. Um, but I think overall, the, you know, our experience taught us that integration is probably one of the top causes of major challenges or obstacles in development. There's always a science on predictability of, you know, you, the outcome of, you know, efficacy or safety once you go in humans. But in our experience, the integration between your chemistry manufacturing, your clinical and your non-clinical is critical. And if you don't do that, uh, we've seen many examples and there's some extreme examples that, you know, I thinking back about it right now, it's just, it does happen and it's pretty shocking. So examples include you have clinicians suddenly having an, evo an, an evolving thinking about their clinical approach, but not engaging with the rest of the functional areas. So CMC non-clinical is not engaged and they find themselves with this brilliant idea of doing an IV clinical trial, but all along the plan was to do an oral clinical trial. So now changing the route of administration in the clinic, which sounded like a great idea for, you know, many reasons behind it, was not in sync with the non-clinical and to a certain extent CMC program. And now they find themselves with a major gap and that's going to represent a development challenge. So it is absolutely critical. We've heard also, you know, you may have heard stories of, um, you know, formulations that are not uh, necessarily going to be compatible with in vivo use. So in the lab, the chemistry group is trying to make this molecule soluble um, and they finally managed to do that. But when you superimpose that, well, could we use that from an in vivo use standpoint? So animals or humans, you quickly find out that it would not be acceptable. So then they got to go back to square one. So there's multiple examples where in your thinking, both from a strategic standpoint, but also execution standpoint as the data is generated. If you don't have that integrative interactive discussion, it's going to be bound to bring quite a bit of challenges. So yeah, absolutely critical to integrate those functions. Great. Marilyn, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I agree completely with the examples um, that Denny mentioned. And Probably the most common one I see is a mismatch between the clinical trial design and length of clinical trial and what uh, tox work is necessary to support that. You know, we've been, um, it's been more flexible the last few years with in oncology because of S9, um, but that's a very small scope. <laughs> and it's always amazing to me how many people think, well, you know, our disease is really serious too. So we should be able to do the same thing um, that people do with uh, S9. And so they want to dose people forever with a one month tox study. So I, I would say that's probably the most common disconnect I see. Thank you. Um, I have a general question for you, Mary Ellen. Um, what are some of the major considerations that you factor in when you're developing a regulatory strategy? Yeah, so from a, a regulatory perspective, I think it's really important to know the therapeutic area, what all the guidances are in that uh, therapeutic area. I mean, the FDA, I, I sometimes think it's, it's, it's amazing how many guidances there are, and in addition to sort of the, just the standard tox guidances and the ICH guidances and then the toxicology guidances. And then there's a lot of um, you know, individual guidances on, on different diseases. And sometimes there are, people don't realize there are preclinical nuggets in there, you know, little sections that can be really helpful. So that's an area I find people often miss, particularly from a preclinical perspective. Regulatory precedent, so knowing what else has been developed in that space, you know, for that disease or in that uh, space in general, I think is, a, is another area where people sometimes, particularly in the preclinical area, forget to spend some um, time um, looking at. Um, and then modality specific issues. You know, if you're talking about a biologic, are you talking about gene therapy, cell therapy, um, a combination of these? I mean, I see things now that are, you know, 
So monoclonal antibodies are sort of become very common now, but people attach all kinds of things to monoclonal antibodies. And then it's not even just the whole monoclonal, maybe it's just an FC or an FAB portion and it's attached to some something else. And then, you know, you have all your, your delivery systems and, and your medical devices attached. So really understanding the guidances or the regulatory precedent for the modalities, I think is also important. So it's a real, you know, a mesh. <laughs> An integrated uh, strategy is really important. And I, the other thing I'll just throw out is I always think it's important, you know, it was one of the things we did, you know, at Amgen and I often tell clients to think about as well is developing a target product profile. So you, it's really hard to get to the end you want if you don't know what that end is in the beginning. And so I think it's, it's important to, to develop that early on and then to keep refreshing that periodically to make sure you're on track or maybe the profile, the target has changed, um, but then you may need to change your pathway to get there. Great. Denny, anything to add? You're on mute. <laughs> My apologies. Um, so I think Marilyn captured it pretty nicely here. The only other small thing I can think of is there's also the corporate slash business aspects. And I know it's kind of weird for scientists to bring that in, uh, but it is definitely, if you work on project teams, especially integrated, you will have to face the reality of your, you know, where your car company or corporation is at. They may not have all the resource to do everything you need to do in a certain way. And there may be creative path or strategies that you need to come up with. Um, again, we always say without compromising patient safety, that's prime. And that's what we strive to make sure, you know, is not, is not at play here. But yeah, just, just that corporate, um, you know, it could be resources, it could be timing, it could be promise to market. So, you, you, you know, just to add on to that, that's the non-scientific consideration that unfortunately, fortunately, you know, um, some drug developer find themselves in a business environment. Yeah, and just to add to both of your responses, um, I love the fact that, Mary Ellen, you brought up the creativity of researchers out there in creating novel structures. Uh, it's no longer just protein or uh, a chemical entity. You have fusions of, of both. You have oligonucleotides coming in multitude of different forms. So some things are truly novel that are coming out, and there is nothing really out there. Then I would recommend also engagement of the regulatory agents very early on. I find in today's age that they will offer more advice than they did say a decade ago. Whereas here's the line, just meet what we need and we'll talk about it later once you submit. Now they're giving more proactively good advice on how to uh, overcome some scientific and practical challenges. So, um, you know, Marilyn, you brought up in your last response about TPPs. So, Denny, I, I also brought up TPP, uh, the uh, target product profile, where we set up a, a laundry list of things. Um, what would you recommend for developers of drugs in the very early discovery on how to create an effective TPP? Uh, yeah, so and that's a great question. So the first thing that is, um, you know, critical when you're putting together a TPP is having a cross-functional input. Um, you know, you can have different aspects of the TPP that feeds into different, you know, elements of your target product profile. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, that's where you quickly realize when you go through these exercises that, you know, one aspect or functional area might have a view or a vision or an opinion on what that criteria might look like. But then you start to quickly realize that from other areas, so clinical or from a uh, commercial standpoint, bless you, <laughs> from a commercial st standpoint, you know, there may be consideration that play into that target product profile. So that's one of the key elements, cross-functional inputs and discussion. The next thing is build in some flexibility. There will be changes as your product evolves. So, you know, I, I always compare that to traveling somewhere, right? So establishing the destination, number one, that's what the TPP will help you do. But as you're navigating that route towards that destination, things are gonna change. Roads are gonna be blocked. Airlines are gonna be canceled, right? So it, there's, there's gotta be a, an inerrant built-in ability to adapt and, and respond. An example is, 
you might put in your TPP, and I'm going back quite a few years ago in the GLP-1 agonist days where, you know, a carcinogenic C signal would be a non-starter for, you know, a drug that is intended to be for chronic treatment of a non-life, you know, uh, threatening and or, you know, seriously debilitating disease in the short term. So, but quickly the class came up as, well, there was a signal in a rodent. So, you know, if you have built in that flexibility, it became a class effect. So you could have elected to not pursue the development in your, based on your TPP profile or, you know, your TPP. And now the environment has changed and it's, you know, there's multiple GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4 antagonists, uh, you know, on the market. Um, so just, just build in flexibility and allow yourself to change course, to adapt to the changing environment, I think is another critical um, element. Great, thank you. Um, along the same subject of TPP, uh, Mary Ellen, uh, what happens, what would you recommend if uh, a company reaches a kind of a roadblock of finding uh, within their library a suitable candidate to move forward to IND? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, obviously that's not a place a lot of people want to find themselves. So it sort of depends on the benefit risk to the, to the treatment population. Obviously a more high risk population might be willing to, um, you know, take and be, for, even if it's just in a study situation to see whether um, a drug that doesn't have a great um, profile otherwise, to see whether or not you can engage in the disease, to see whether or not you can bring some benefit. Um, obviously you can't do that in a low risk um, disease or low risk population, but perhaps you can do that, you know, in the right population. Yeah, um, for myself, I've seen this many times where you go through and you, and you want to select, you, you have milestones to reach and there's a lot of pressure to select one. Um, I've seen where um, companies have just stopped and went back and generated new compounds um, based on the information that they got to lead towards a, a better profile of candidate. And I've also seen a couple companies actually take their best, knowing that it's not going to be um, uh, viable to go all the way to the clinic, but to gain that early uh, clinical understanding on a new class of compounds or mechanism and still develop a background uh, or backup candidate such that once they identified one with, with more ideal candidates where they're comfortable really developing straight uh, more into the advanced clinical trials, that the first lead candidate it actually paved the road so they can move very quickly and catch up to that point. It's more costly to do it that way, but it is a strategy that can be used, especially if you're in uncharted territories using something that's truly novel and that you don't have predecessors or other uh, companies that have already staked out or marketed a path forward in, in that situation. So um, it, you're right, it's hard to be in that position, but there are ways to get around it. And it may just take some decision making on whether you stay uh, or you try to forge and gain more information such that uh, for the benefit in the long term of that particular program. Yeah, but well, that's a question of resources, right? <laughs> it, <laughs> is, resources. it is. But perhaps you could identify a biomarker, right? That would, as you said, really expedite the next follow on molecule. So. Yeah. And in clinics, that's actually a great point because more and more clinical trials are basing on biomarkers as a surrogate point of efficacy. So that becomes extremely important for clinicians to be able to have that marker um, to monitor the progress of patients. And, and it's something that's being incorporated more and more into clinical trials, not just the primary safety endpoints. Uh, Denny, uh, another question for you is that, uh, you know, for myself, when I'm presenting in these types of seminars and workshops, uh, there's, uh, especially on drug development, there's a question of always about funding, you know, we're ready to eager to go. How do you go about getting funding? So I'm just wondering, do you have any words of wisdom on developing a strategy to be able to be effective in attracting investments into your technology or starting a new company? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the, 
the number one thing that we see is, and you know, typically what helps is to understand when it does not work. <laughs> so, um, you know, some of the things that we've seen uh, that is would help, and if you achieve that effectively, would definitely increase your chances of you know success, is making sure that whenever you're gonna uh, you know develop a plan or present, you know, in addition to your TPP, but also your development plan. That again, you understand the science, you understand the medical need. Um, you know, unfortunately, you're you know you're mentioning um, funding. Uh, you know, business needs money to run, and there's a cost associated to the business. So it's really important that they understand that you know, uh, you know what you're realistically are going to face. Um, the plan needs to be realistic as well. I think a lot of the times people want to impress, and they put out there either very you know low estimates and or very aggressive timelines that you know may or may not be based on reality so i think you know connecting with that important aspects of you know a sound rationale you know development program and when you're presenting it showing that you have done your homework that's where you might you know need to bring people in with the expertise and to help you with that aspect uh, but I think something that's really grounded in science has a lot more credibility. So the goal is to achieve credibility with those investors or potential venture capitalists so that they understand they're not just going to throw their money at something that has not been well thought out. So I think that's one of the key major thing that we see uh, happen a lot is people are putting this down quickly. It's underestimating a lot of elements and that typically doesn't gain a lot of credibility sometimes with those investors. That's one of the key ones. All great points. Marilyn, do you want to add anything? Well, you know, I think we've talked um, about some of the ways to, to bring funding in, through, through obviously through investors, partnerships, venture capital uh, grants. Um, a lot of the investment is based on the things that, you know, Denny talked about, the science and the strength of the science. Another thing I see that can make a big influence is the people you have in your team, mm -hmm. right? Do they have a track record? Have they developed drugs? Where have they worked before? And, and you know, how many times people will call me and say, "Oh, we have so and so on our board," and that it, that name alone is, you know, meant to carry um, the company forward somewhat. So, I, I guess I just wanted to throw that point out as well. Having the right people on your team can be really important. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one that I will, a couple things that I would add to to the great list of things to do is also think about uh, how you envision the company growing. Um, are you going to take it to a certain level? I think ASIC strategy is very important for many VC companies and in understanding how, how do they see monetizing their investment. Uh, and I think also the other aspect is I've seen with a lot of different companies is to be open with different ways of gaining investments. There's no one right strategy. It could be you know, building small and using SBIR grants with non-diluted funds. It could be getting angel investors. It could be going to VCs directly and utilizing your network as much as possible. Even like with ULP, they have a great network of people associated with the incubator. You'd be able to make those connections and gain advice on strategies or even investments. So, you take every opportunity to learn about this and, and try to develop a, a succinct vision for the company. So th those are a few words of advice that I would have. Um, Mary Ellen, what are some factors that companies should consider in developing um, that, the pitch deck to attract investment? So you, you now are put in front of potential investors. What would you, do you have any words of wisdom for them uh, on how to uh, go about being effective in presenting their company? Well, I think having a well-designed regulatory strategy to advance the drug program into, all the way into humans is really important. Um, uh, the design helps define the company's needs, manage the expectations. The regulatory strategy is really key. Is there a regulatory pathway um, is it a well-worn pathway? Are you setting new precedent? And, you know, again, this gets back to sort of the very first question in terms of getting early engagement, um, trying to figure out whether or not you need to engage with the FDA early. Do you need a pre-IND meeting? If you're in a cell gene therapy area, maybe you need a interact meeting. And having those meetings and, and having documented meetings, you know, can actually also help, you know, show investors that you have a, 
there is a path to get forward um, even before you've started your, your toxicology studies. Yeah, I agree with you. Something that when um, newly formed companies come to Charles River, Kristen and I would actually hear their, their, um, their story and they would ask us, okay, what do you envision? Uh, what are the milestones? You know, we want to be in the IND at uh, X time. And we say, nope, that's not reasonable. And they go, why? And we say, okay, we help you with, you know, and, and it's really educating them. And you're right, being able to have all those financials, timelines, being orderly. And because VCs, especially with VCs, they've been in the business. They know what reasonable timelines are. They're not going to ask for something that's super fast. They want something that's reasonable and that you know what those expectations are and, and you know how to get to those milestones. Denny, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, maybe just a few couple of points. So one thing that came to mind when you asked a question is definitely making sure that you understand the indication of the population you're targeting. Um, you know, some of those venture capitalists are pretty smart and or may have, um, you know, advice and or input from other people. So when you're doing your pitch, just be ready, well prepared to be able to defend why you believe this is an indication or a population that makes sense for your science. Um, the other aspect of that as well is, and again, just overlaying on top of the science here is the business aspect of everything we do. So venture capitalists uh, are going to ask questions. What's your cost of goods? How much is that going to cost you to develop this drug or manufacture it? And is there potential for reimbursement? Because, I'm, you know, obviously, once your drug launches in the market, reimbursement is a huge attractive factor. Is there any you know, benefit in developing the drug or what's the mission? Are we developing this drug for an orphan indication? The, the, the goal or mission of the company is not necessarily to generate a lot of revenue, but have a patient mission. I think that speaks volume to some of those investors as well. Um, or is it more a kind of investor that wants to see return on their investment and all they will focus on in addition to your science and probability of technical success is how much money is that going to get me? And that's the unfortunate reality of, you know, drug development when you have investments, um, you know, um, aspects. Great. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to turn over the webinar to Kristen, who will uh, ask some questions that have come in. Hi, Sam, and, and thanks, everyone. This is a really engaging discussion. Um, so we had a couple questions come in, um, and one of which we already answered. I'll, I'll give it a minute too to see if anybody else wants to um, uh, to jump in from the audience, and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, but one of the things was, um, you know, what are some common mistakes that you see companies make in terms of, um, you know, hiring consultants or other support? I think it's kind of a, a practical question to ask um, for a lot of our, our viewers. Great question. Um, Denny, would you like to answer? Sure, I can jump in and I'm sure Mary Helen has, has an interesting answer too. Um, I would say probably not doing your due diligence. Uh, you know, we sometimes get involved with people that, you know, need help and they're obviously, you know, in need of help. Um, but then, you know, we find ourselves telling them what kind of question they should ask us and, you know, offering to share some documentation or some, you know, track record of, you know, this is why we believe you should hire us. So don't forget about due diligence. A lot of people don't do that. Um, the other aspect is hiring someone you've worked with before, but for a completely different scenario and assuming that they can provide the expertise for now your new situation. They may or may not. So, you know, we, as humans, we have a tendency to go back to what we know it's comforting. There's already an established contract and relationship. Um, sometimes that person might feel compelled to help you um, and they may not have the expertise. So again, it's kind of tying in with doing your due diligence, um, but it's really critical that again, don't assume that they can help you in all these areas. And there are things that you can do to verify or validate. If you have a network, you can ask around. Um, Mary Allen mentioned that a lot of her old ex colleagues or, you know, former colleagues are, you know, reaching out because they know her expertise and they know she can do the work. So that's kind of, you know, resources you can use to try to help to not make those mistakes, I guess. Yeah, toxicology is, is a small world. So um, yeah, I think word of mouth definitely matters. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is I have seen people do what I call consultant shopping. 
you know, they, um, they, they keep asking people until they get the answer they want, <laughs> as opposed to the answer they need. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come across that as well. Um, the uh, one other question too, I'm, I, I hope there's, there's a few more from the audience too. I'd really welcome anyone who has, um, has a question they're holding back, please go ahead. Um, but, you know, in, in your opinion, is there one thing about, um, is there one thing people outsourcing their development program, you know, what is that one thing they should be thinking about? If you were to pick one, the number one priority for outsourcing their development program. Yeah. I, I would say making sure that you work with um, an outsourcing group, you know, if you're talking about a CRO to run your talk studies, that has the experience and the capability um, and that has done the work before. Uh, there are lots of, you know, people who will say, well, we've never done that, but we'll try it. Um, you know, unless you have something really, really novel and new, and of course that happens sometimes too, you know, you should try to find somebody that has tried that path before and has that experience. Denny? Yeah, development is a long and costly process. Pick the right partner. I wholeheartedly agree with what Mary Helen just said. Um, that could be your biggest mistake if you don't do that carefully. Yeah, and from my perspective, just to give it a little bit different, is um, if you're doing something that's truly novel, um, sometimes manufacturing could be a rate limiting step, especially if it's not going, say, the traditional route of medicinal chemistry or cell lines for protein expression, if you're doing some kind of hybrid and you can make it on the bench top, but to scale it up may be something very different. I think that that early research on that and trying to understand how you're going to go to large scale, because that's what you'll need to be able to support your talk studies, as well as the clinical setting, it can be very costly and time consuming. So that's something, another factor that comes in. Um, I think that, especially in today's trends in drug development, um, CROs are, are critically important. Um, we're seeing more and more of the large pharma um, not uh, shutting down their vivariums and, and, and outsourcing it out. And I think that for virtual companies, it doesn't make sense for them to build out a vivarium, um, especially with all the regulations for uh, validated methods and, and the study conduct under GM, uh, GLP compliance. It can be very costly and, and it's better to get an experienced CRO to help you with those things. So that would be my input. Kristen? Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice. Um, so, so some of the, the folks who are watching today too, a lot of them may be um, thinking about starting their own company, have ideas that they want to, uh, to bring to the market. Um, so if you were a founding, uh, founding a company or starting your own drug development program, what would be the first thing that you would do based on your experience uh, with all of these emerging companies that you've dealt with? Ooh, that's a really mm. tough question. Uh, <laughs> Denny, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, from my perspective, it's going to come that so assuming you have, you know, a strong scientifically based technology or promising, you know, lead candidate or product or at least platform. Um, I'm going to go back to the same thing I just said, uh, pick the right people. Um, you know, the success of a program, project, company or drug, you know, there's the component of the science will speak for itself. But I've seen so many times where you have an amazing technology or promising product and they fail because you don't have the right team or the right people. So that'd be my number one, get the right people. People will make it work. Everything else, if you have the right people, you can work it out. Great. Mary Ellen? Yeah, and people, that's, I agree. That's, that, you know, it's people that uh, have the experience and the know-how and, and people that you enjoy working with, right? If you're gonna do something like this, starting anew full time, it becomes more than a 40 hour a week project if you're really starting a new company. So you wanna make sure you're working with people that you trust and that uh, you enjoy working with. Yeah, great points. And, and I, I couldn't agree more with you too. 
Uh, one of the things that I would like to say as an encouragement is that I've seen postdocs actually start companies and um, taking a lead project with the uh, professor being the chief scientific officer or uh, the head of the scientific advisory board, but not having the PI being the CEO. I think one of the key things is that there's a distinction between being an expert in a field and translating it into drug development and it's completely different territories. Um, I know for myself as an anecdote is that when I went transition from academics to biotech, one of the fundamental things that people in my position to succeed in drug development or get out of, uh, of the biotech space was to change the philosophy of how you see science. Um, in academics, everything is a good question. You know, if, it, if, if there's a question to be asked, and you can get an answer, you, you search for it uh, to gain better understanding. But in drug development, if, it, if the question doesn't move your drug program closer to the clinic, it doesn't matter what the question is, it's not worth pursuing. And that's sometimes hard for researchers to gain through. But one of the key things about um, getting experienced people in, as Denny and Marilyn have spoken to, is that business aspect of it. To, understand, especially critically at the beginning, to be able to form the company quickly, to know the right people to bring in, and what are the steps forward such that the VCs or any potential large investors will see the confidence in, in moving that uh, company forward to success. So uh, people is absolutely critical. Kristen? Um, yeah, no, I think that's the, oh, hold on. There was one that just came in on the wire here. Hold on. Um, so there was a question that, what's the first thing you would do to de-risk your product? Um, how do you find out very early on if the product is a no-go for investing your time and money? And does it differ whether you're working with a small molecule versus a biologic? I think that's a really good question. It's a great question. Um, Denny or Mary Ellen, do you want to start first? Mary Ellen? Well, there's no one right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think is the problem. Um, you know, again, it depends on the therapeutic indication, the population, et cetera. What's, um, you know, I guess first, that you know, do you have a drug? Right? I, I guess. To go, to go back to first steps, if you're trying to develop a product or you know, medical product, is it an actual drug? Can you make it? Can you test it? Can you prove what you have? Um, you know, these are not really tox issues, but, but sometimes people come to you, you know, they want to run a tox study, and then it turns out it's not really that well defined what it is that they want you to run the study on, right? Is it reproducible, et cetera? So, you know, I, I guess I would say first, can you make it? Do you have the rights to make it? You know, there's there's sort of a list of sort of fun, fundamental, um, is it a drug kind of questions, I guess would be the first thing. Yeah, yeah. From a, just to add to that, from a de-risking, sorry, um, Sam, uh, just from a de-risking standpoint, I think the way that I understood part of the question was also, what can I do earlier in my development program so I can effectively try to de-risk the later steps? So if I understood the question or that aspect of the question correctly, what I, we try to encourage and is sometimes possible is to do what I kind of alluded to earlier, bring in earlier on in your development or even it can be even at the candidate nomination, it could be a criteria that you set as a selection for lead or backup um, a set of data that will educate a little bit more on the safety aspect of it. Some examples are capturing clinical observations and or some safety endpoints in your in vivo pharmacology study, for example, if that's possible. Uh, embedding some of the genotox screening assay earlier on in your candidate nomination or some of the cardiovascular marker like HERG or so and, and a lot of the large organization pharma started doing that quite a few years ago to kind of try to de-risk um, how much de-risking or can you de-risk 100%? Um, probably not. But at least, um, you know, those are some of the strategies that we've seen and implemented sometimes to try to leverage 
um, you know, those tools earlier on to try to de-risk when you're, you know, you've selected it, at least you have some basic information that you can make decisions on. PKADME is also sometimes, uh, you know, something that people underestimate, especially earlier on. They assume it's going in there, it's going to go where it needs to go. And then when you get kind of close to that bridge, some company have a good PKADME program, some can't afford it or don't have the time for it or the resource for it. So those are kind of things that I would alert if you want to de-risk, understand those scientific aspects of your molecule earlier, and you can bring some of those tools um, in your earlier stage before IND enabling. Yeah, thank you, Denny. I have two comments on that. I think earlier in, during our discussions, uh, we brought up the TPP, the, the laundry list of uh, properties, and those will be unique to your drug class it's really important to define what are good criteria ahead of time and then impartially evaluate your, your, your assets to, to see if they're truly ideal candidates to move forward or not. There are differences between small molecule and biologic. I think with biologic, it goes to more to the target in a way, um, but just simplifying to say a monoclonal antibody, I would say that you have to look at the pharmacology uh, aspects of where you're targeting within a certain pathway. Um, in my slide presentation, I, I, I showed that uh, um, you, one of the major factors of a drug failing, um, failing is uh, clinical efficacy. So I have one company where they were uh, affecting a pathway, not to disclose anything, but they were affecting a particular pathway that was known to control uh, for allergies. And they selected a different part of the pathway that's still integral, but it was a different place where other drugs were, drug companies were focused on. And they felt they had a competitive edge because they were new to attacking this particular part of the pathway. They went through their safety, they had great safety, came to, but when it came to the clinic, it failed because it wasn't effect, truly effective in the, clinical set, in the clinical setting. So with biologics, that's something that I would always look at is really, are you, are you going after a, good, a very good target? So it's, diff, it's a little bit less to the molecule itself, it's more to the target, where small molecule, I think there's more classic properties that Denny had mentioned. Denny? Yeah, I just wanted to add, so you made me think of something else as well. So, uh, and I think Mary Ellen might have referred to that or, you know, alluded to that earlier um, in another question, uh, the, the precedence, right? So you can be in a class or uh, there's literature information available out there, both from the public domain, um, you know, like PubMed and whatnot, but also from the regulatory agency website. So having and an awareness and understanding of whichever pathway you may be targeting, there may be some unique class uh, effects that, again, having that knowledge early, you can start embedding in your screening program, am I going to get the same signal or do you have a differentiator there where you may or may not have that biomarker popping up or, you know, assay or endpoint or target. So that's another thing that I just thought about as far as de-risking, using what's available to educate yourself and then benchmark your targets and or the class you might be in. Great, thank you. Let's I was just um, gonna oh, add that yes. you, you reminded me, so when I was at Amgen, we had actually started a formal process called a target liability assessment. Mm -hmm. And that's something I talk about even in my consulting and I think I've given some talks and other webinars like this about target liability assessments you know, a formal process going through the literature, regulatory precedent, all these types of things, because for the biologic, you know, with the theory that these are very target specific molecules, really understanding your target. And, you know, it's turned out that even with the more novel therapies like cell therapies, that people have seen unexpected toxicities in the clinic because they didn't understand the target fully. They found, turned out that that you know, CAR T cell, whatever, was actually um, binding, not to something unknown, but to, they, they didn't know where those, those receptors were as well. Great point, excellent, thank you.